Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, What Are Blockchains Anyway? Uh, why don't we get started and introduce ourselves? Rich? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Rich Gatz. Um, I'm a data privacy attorney um, focusing on issues in cyber insurance, data privacy, um, and some cryptocurrency and blockchain related matters. Um, so in fact, I got my start in the data privacy and technology related subject matter because I was the only person in 2013 that knew what a Bitcoin was. Um, and it's, it's massively changed my life, not to the point, and don't trust me, I did not keep all the Bitcoins that I had in 2013 or else I'd be doing this virtually from my island. But, um, you know, still been involved in cryptocurrency and, and other things um, since 2013 and uh, very happy to be here. Hi, I'm Andrew Hirsch. I'm a computer scientist at the University at Buffalo, um, where I focus on programming languages and computer security uh, and more and more on concurrency and distribution as a place where I'm interested in. So security and distribution and programming languages all coming together in blockchains. So I'm excited to talk about them. And uh, I'm Isaac Sheff. I'm a distributed system scientist at a startup called Heliax, and I'm your moderator for today. So I want to leave plenty of time for questions, but I do want to start with laying out a little bit of vocabulary. Uh, there is a lot of jargon in this space, so for our discussion, I just want to uh, define blockchain, ledger, cryptocurrency, voter, proof of stake, proof of work, consensus. Uh, so these days, in particular, a uh, blockchain can refer to pretty much any distributed ledger which is built to tolerate failures. And so by ledger, uh, I mean that it's a totally ordered list of data which only ever appends new data to the end. You can't insert something in the middle. Um, so you could make a ledger just fine with a spreadsheet uh, in, in Excel or whatever, or even on paper so long as you only ever add stuff to the end. There are lots of things that you can build on top of a ledger. Uh, you could imagine a government appending each new bill that they vote into law onto the end of a ledger. Uh, the fact that the ledger is totally ordered becomes useful. You always can tell which laws happened before which other laws, which is important, I'm told. Um, you could run a bank on top of a ledger. You can append transactions of the form uh, Alice pays Bob this amount of money. And if you read over the entire ledger, you can calculate how much money everyone has. And again, order is important. If Alice only has $1, and there's a transaction that says Alice pays Bob a dollar, and there's a different one that says Alice pays Carol a dollar, it matters which one happens first, because that controls who got the dollar. Um, banks usually don't allow you to quote unquote double spend your money. Uh, you do have to make sure, though, that random people can't just have Alice pays me $5 appended to the ledger whenever they want. Uh, come to think of it, you probably um, need something similar for our law blockchain too. Laws only really count if uh, they're signed by the right people. So this is where the crypto part comes in. We decide that transactions only count if they are cryptographically signed by the relevant people and cryptographic signatures in general uh, cannot be forged. So if you run your bank on money that you just made up instead of cash deposits or whatever banks normally use, then you have a cryptocurrency. So the technical difference between uh, what makes a spreadsheet not a blockchain is that blockchains tolerate failures, by which I mean that blockchains are built to keep running even when a significant portion of the computers running them die or are straight up corrupt. And this is supposed to make them extra trustworthy. So generally speaking, to make that happen, you need lots of machines keeping copies of the ledger, and all of them have to update it with the same data more or less at the same time. So to encourage people to keep the same up-to-date copies, most public uh, blockchains pay their replicas, usually in cryptocurrency. Payment usually comes in some form of a uh, combination of money, either made up when the cryptocurrency was started, uh, or with fees paid by people who want to append stuff to the ledger. Then you have the problem of getting everyone to agree on what thing they're going to append next. So we need some definition of who is everyone. Ultimately, every blockchain is maintained by some set of machines called validators or miners or replicas or whatever who vote in some sense on what information is added to the ledger. Enough votes then serve as evidence that a version of the ledger is official. If enough of those voters are corrupt, uh, they could you could imagine them voting twice and make two equally valid but contradictory versions of the ledger. Uh, maybe there'd be one version where Bob thinks he got all of Alice's money and another version where Carol thinks that she got all of Alice's money and that will be a double spend attack. So that's why blockchains make being a voter expensive. 
They don't want some jerk, traditionally named Sybil, to show up and make lots of voting accounts or whatever. This is the internet. Anyone can pretend to be multiple people. And then single-handedly cause most of the votes to, most of the voters to double vote. So one way to do that, if you're running a cryptocurrency anyway, is to give people as many votes as they hold cryptocurrency. In order to corrupt the vote, you'd need a sizable portion of the currency, which uh, would be expensive. And any corruption on that blockchain would probably, at least eventually, crash the value of the cryptocurrency. And presumably, you wouldn't want that if you owned a sizable portion of it. So that is proof of stake. Another way to rig it is so that in order to cast a vote, uh, you have to prove that you used a lot of time computing on some expensive hardware by computing something hard to compute. And that's called proof of work. There are a lot of other ways to do it, uh, and there are actually lots of different voting methods uh, called consensus protocols. But the point is, all blockchains involve having some kind of set of voters, uh, however they're chosen, that you ultimately do trust. The word trustless is sometimes thrown around, and it's a bit of a misnomer. So let's pretend that for some reason I trust the Ethereum voters, and I see that they're using their ledger to run, uh, instead of a law system or a bank, something that they call a virtual machine. Uh, Andrew, what does it mean to run a virtual machine on a ledger? You know, that's a really good question. So when we look at running computers, what programs do, there, there's a lot of ways to view them, but one of the best ways to view them is as a way of transforming one state into another state. And then you just do this over and over and over again until you get to some state that you want. Um, and we can just put that... The, because you have one state, then another state, then another state, then another state, and you're always appending to the end. That sounds a lot like a ledger to me. So what you can do is you can just put these on a, a blockchain. And that way you can actually run programs uh, that do things like, well, the number one thing that they do is run pyramid schemes. <laughs> uh, where's, actually, where, Where's the lie? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, the thing is, they won't even lie to you. They'll just tell you, yeah, this is a pyramid yeah. scheme. Sign up now before your friends do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, you can run arbitrary code that can run in these, ex uh, that can uh, exchange Ethereum tokens uh, on the Ethereum blockchain uh, by just appending the, uh, the next state on at every step of your program. And then all the voters have to check that the next state is like a valid transition from the previous state. Yeah. Um, so I'm told that uh, when, you, when we do these appends, the, the code is written in something we call smart contracts, uh, which are programs running on this virtual machine. Uh, Rich, are they smart or contracts? So Either, both? <laughs> it, it, you know, and, and I've said this before at another panel, so if any repeat customers, I apologize for the redundancy. But um, just everyone should know how to be a lawyer today. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to be a lawyer so you can go home. You do not have a law degree. You do not actually practice law. But you can say, hey, I stayed at Holiday Inn Express last night. I now know the answer to every legal question ever. It, is, it depends because you need to understand the facts and circumstances around whatever the question is. And then depending upon those facts and circumstances, it might still be it depends. So my formal final answer is it depends. Um, if they're smart or actual contracts. Because in order for there to be a contractual relationship, you need something that in, in the legal world we call bargained for consideration. So any lawyers in here, this was hammered into you your first, second, third day in law school. And what that means is in order to have a legally viable agreement, you need to have something that's been bargained for, okay? And it needs to be a consideration. So that's a fancy way of saying you need to give me something for something. All right. So the difficulty with smart contracts is oftentimes you have like permissionless, which maybe you can discuss from a technical perspective, like who is bargaining for that consideration? Who is getting what for getting this? Right. And additionally, there needs to be typically an explanation of the contractual terms and conditions. So if you have a smart contract that outlines, all right, um, in exchange for this token, we will give you permission to operate this whatever. And it outlines, you know, the rights and responsibilities of both parties under in that smart contract. Then that might be legally enforceable. But the question then you have is, and I'm kind of being very broad here, who enforces the contract? If, it, if it's decentralized ledger, right, or blockchain technology, you can't, you know, 
go to someone and say, "Hey, um, is this a, a an arbit? Is there arbitration provisions in the smart contract? Is it you know?" So you know, whereas you might have something in some cases that qualifies as a contract, it might not have the protections of a contractual agreement because there's actually no way to enforce the terms of the contract. Right. The idea is supposed to be that because this contract is computer code, although I think based on Rich's description of what would be needed for it to be contract, you'd have to include more than the code. You'd have to include exactly. some human readable comments exactly. that would also have to be enforceable. But uh, the idea is supposed to be that because the contract is code, um, there's uh, no enforcement necessary. It's just the next step is what the next step in the code is. But of course, because this is all done by appending states to the uh, blockchain, and these are voted on by these voters, um, and these voters are supposed to check that it's the valid next step, but if they all conspire together to just append the step where you pay us all money, um, you can't really stop them. Right. No, and, and that's very true. You know, and, and now there is, you know, there is some ways that you can kind of incorporate a smart contract into a larger contractual agreement, right? Like everyone's had a contract that has this addendum is hereby formally blah, 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 like go another three paragraphs and then you finally understand what they're trying to say. But it can be part like a smart contract, not you know, forgetting the actual legal definition of what a contract is, could be part of a larger agreement, right? There could be terms and conditions where that smart contract and that kind of automated kind of appending and things in, in that kind of binary state could actually be part of a fully enforceable contract. So one of the contracts that uh, has made news, well, for the last several months now, is uh, contracts not just defining a specific currency, but rather defining a specific token. Just one owner that can be changed, that can be transferred to the, the next owner of the token, possibly with um, some kind of addendums attached. So these are non-fungible tokens or NFTs, and often they uh, any given token will claim that it bestows rights to some work of art or something like that. So technically, I can put a, a non-fungible token on any blockchain I like, as long as I have permission to append to it that purports to have ownership of uh, the Mona Lisa or, I don't know, um, William Shakespeare's soul. Um, what does it take for an NFT to actually convey ownership of, say, a work of art? Sure, yeah. And I think, so you still have to qualify as a copyrightable thing, right? So like the Mona Lisa, isn't copyrightable. It's legitimately in the public domain, which it means you could create an NFT um, based upon that, but there would have to be something original about it. So generally speaking, in order to receive copyright protection in the United States and arguably everywhere else, it needs to be an original work of art. All right. It can't be derivative of something else that's not in the public domain. It, it needs to be something that you've come up with. It needs to be not necessarily novel, but original. And so that's very broad. So if you did some, you know, created a machine learning algorithm or did something else that was truly unique and original, you could potentially have a copyright in, a, in an NFT of um, the Mona Lisa, right? Now, if you do have a copyrightable, you know, property interest, that's transferable, that's assignable. Now, could you do it via a smart contract? Potentially. If you outline it and if you're doing the if you have an actual bargained for consideration right like if you're getting something for that original piece of art and again it's copyrightable now the thing is is there is a big difference between having a copyright and making sure no one else uses your copyright okay and so in the nft space if you have someone that, you know, you see a lot of NFT, um, there's a lot of copycats for the popular NFTs out there, right? If they do that, okay. So yeah, you got a copyright in Board 8 Yacht Club, right? Like supposedly ownership of those NFTs go to whoever owns the, the private keys for that specific smart contract. Someone starts using it as their Twitter profile. Yeah, you could write them a cease and desist letter and, and potentially say, hey, you stop using this. But if they're completely anonymized and whatnot, like there's no enforceable basis for it. So yes, you can you can transfer copyrights, you can transfer ownership of, you know, because an NFT arguably is an original work of of art, and I'd say art not in the perspective of just pictures, paintings, but art as in like anything, right? And so, but then the secondary consideration is okay, you have a copyright, but if everyone violates it what can you really do to stop them from using it? 
just touching on what you said on art, uh, what actually is copyrightable or considered art? What about a script for a movie? What about right. a sculpture, a physical sculpture? Yep, absolutely. Uh, what All about architectural blueprints for a building? So original work, and I guess another way to put it would be original work of authorship, right? So the key there is original, right? And then it can be really anything, okay? Now, the thing with copyrights is that you know, there's essentially six rights bundled with all copyrights, like ownership rights, uh, distribution rights, derivative work rights. There's a couple other I can't remember off the top of my head. But, um, you know, it can really be anything. And it's a very, very broad coverage. Like, actually, if you if I were to draw on a napkin right now of a, a picture of myself, blah, 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 I now have a copyright in that. OK, I don't need to file anything. I don't need to register anything. Now, if you take that picture, take a picture of it, put it everywhere, it becomes famous. My legal rights that I have to sue you are limited because I haven't registered it yet with the U.S. Copyright Office. I can only re tell you, hey, stop using it. But if I were to go and register it right away, then I can sue you for statutory damages. Like everyone remembers like Kazaa and all the like the, the music you know industry that went crazy. And you remember those people like, hey, this 15-year-old downloaded 10 songs and they're suing for $1.5 million, right? So that is, if you register a copyright, then you can enforce kind of those statutory damages amounts, which can be very, very large. But generally, it's a very, very broad coverage because it's limited. You only get, I think it's like, I forget the exact number, but we'll just say, you know, X amount of years over the author's life, right? To pre 70, is it 70? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it might be. I might be 70. I'm not very good with numbers. Quick rule, it's uh, whenever... Um, Walt Disney died ago. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, like 1936 or something, right? Yeah, yeah, because there was a new copyright act right around then. And so there's a lot of, and, and we could get into it a little bit if everyone wants, but generally that broad, my point is, it's a very, very broad protection. Okay, it's not like patents, which is kind of narrowed, but it's very strong. Copyright's very broad and very long, but the thing is, is it doesn't last forever, technically. If I take a photo of your nap, so that would not be a copyright because that would be a derivative work of my original work of authorship and unless I assigned you that right or allowed you to do that then that would not be something that you would have because that'd be like saying so you know you know Tolkien's works are potentially coming into the public domain at least some of them in the near distant future right now, what they've done is to protect that copyright, they've done kind of derivative works like movies and things like that that extend the copyright on it, yeah. right? So, but a lot of things in the public domain, if you ever have looked for older books um, that were published uh, 100, 200 years ago, you'll see like a bunch of different electronic formats on like Amazon. Okay, they're in the public domain. You could literally go find a copy of that book, the original one that's no longer in copyright, type it up, listen to Amazon and sell it, okay? So that's some of the technical limitations, or some of the legal limitations, rather, of what we can do uh, in a smart contract. Uh, what are some of the technical limitations? Yeah, I mean, so I tell, at the end of the day, smart contracts only have the ability to do certain things. They can basically move, uh, most of the time what they can do is basically move around money on the blockchain that they're defined on. Um, if you, I mean, some of the, the up and coming technology stuff I know, you're actually working on Isaac uh, uh, involves uh, letting smart contracts move money around between blockchains, which is a really interesting, cool idea. But right now, that's that's really uh, uh, in the future. It's not it's not quite here yet. Um, so, you know, if I run an Ethereum smart contract um, and I make a bunch of Ethereum tokens, that's great for as long as Ethereum tokens have value to me. But if I if uh, Ethereum tokens lose value, then I've lost all the value in that smart contract. Um, NFTs are a really, really cool technical problem, or technical solution. That's a really neat idea. Um, but I think that they are still kind of looking for what they can do with that technology, uh, realistically, more than what they can't do. I mean, they're kind of a way of holding and transferring a permission. Um, mostly it's just permission to transfer this permission on. You can associate legal rights with it to the extent that that's actually allowed and so on. I mean, I guess there's another technical limitation that I would point out for, for things like Ethereum. Um, because there are so many replicas trying to keep track of the same uh, 
sta uh, virtual machine. Ultimately, they all have to execute the same transactions in the same order. And if everybody's competing to append transactions to that, you're sort of still limited by the rate at which any one replica can append transactions in the same order. It's a fundamental rate limit to what we can all agree on in some sense. Then there's also the, the trust issue. You know, uh, it is possible. The idea is that we're supposed to be able to trust the replicas who are all, uh, all these voters because they have a financial incentive, to be honest. And that's true as long as a certain percentage of them uh, aren't, or as long as it's not the case that a certain percentage of them are collaborating. But a certain percentage of them, and I think it's, I, I know it's a half, it might be less now. Uh, half would definitely do it. Um, technically, you can start breaking things at a third on, right. on a lot of chains. If they start collaborating, then uh, all of that assumption is gone because they can do what's called, it's called a selfish mining attack. Where basically what they do is they just start not telling anybody that's not in their little circle of collaborators about blocks they've mined. And then whenever somebody starts putting on blocks that they don't like, they just go, oh, look at this giant blockchain I just found. Um, and then everybody goes, oh, well, that, that one's longer. I guess we'll, we'll accept yours and not the one that had the block you didn't like. Um, and Bitcoin has actually gotten to that point at least once, where more than I think it is a third. Yeah, we've had, of, we've had uh, mining pools grow quite large before. It's unclear if any of them have ever tried to deliberately attack it once they've gotten to that size. But I, I mean, don't think it's currently has anybody at that size, but it, it has happened before and it will happen again. So if anybody out there has like a billion dollars you want to spend buying Bitcoin mining equipment just to deliberately take the whole thing down. Um, you can. <laughs> Um, it will cost you probably billions, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. They say all the Bitcoins in the world, which at that point you could steal, are worth billions. So, I don't know. Maybe it's worth it. <laughs> That's when I think Satoshi Nakamoto comes out of retirement with Moose's <laughs> Genesis block. And it's just like, you know. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's... Do, do you want to explain that maybe for people who... Oh, yeah. Know? So, um, Satoshi Nakamoto is probably the very famous person that kind of um, theorized Bitcoin or blockchain technology as we know it today. He drafted a white paper in, I think, 2003, um, which if you've not read, please read it. It is very, I mean, it's partially technical, but it is very easy to read as a layperson. Um, and it is literally kind of the foundational principles of Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Now, um, Satoshi, who we don't know who it was, um, there's some people that are claiming they're Satoshi. Um, so, Satoshi Nakamoto is kind of the Japanese equivalent of signing your paper, John Smith. It, it doesn't really... Right. So we, we, we don't know who it was, but on BitcoinTalk.org, which was kind of the, the first forum that kind of really discusses this stuff, that was the screen name and kind of the name that they used. It could be multiple people to kind of discuss blockchain technology and Bitcoin specifically. And so this individual or entity mined um, the Genesis block. And so with blockchain and Bitcoin specifically, there's a difficulty increase, right? And they do this to kind of manage the blockchain and also because there's only going to be, um, again, not that good with numbers. Is it 24 million Bitcoin ever produced? 21, 42, million. 21, 21 bi million Bitcoins ever, ever like mined. Okay. But every three or four years, you may have heard of the halvening, right? Every three or four years, um, you, the blockchain, the block reward, right? Because the blockchain is a series of blocks, right? That are basically encapsulating all the transactions on the, on the ledger, right? And then every 10 minutes, someone solves for a block. And then all those transactions from the prior 10 minutes are now permanently on the blockchain. And the reward for solving that block is Bitcoin. And so every, like I said, it halves on a set number of transactions or blocks uh, every three and a half, four years. Well, initially it was like thousands of Bitcoins a block. Okay. Right now I think it's six. Is it 12? I think it's 12 and a half. It's 12 and a half, right? right? And then in 2024, it's going to have again to six and uh, 1.5 or whatever it is. So the first blocks mined on the blockchain provided a massive, massive amount of Bitcoin. And these Bitcoins were mined to a specific address or multiple addresses that have not moved. They've never been moved. And there's thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of Bitcoins are there, like billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. And so one of the kind of interesting things and terrifying things about Bitcoin and blockchain and the cryptocurrency space generally is what happens if they move. 
okay? Because right now, the market price, allegedly, of Bitcoin is those Bitcoins are gone forever, okay? So if they move, gosh forbid, go to Coinbase or Gemini or something, or are sold, what does that do to Bitcoin infrastructure? What does that do to the price? What does that do to what we know about it, right? It'd be like, you know, if we were selling the gold standard and then all of a sudden you walked into a cave and there was billions of pounds of gold, right? You just started handing them out to people, right? Rapid deflationary, or I'm sorry, rapid inflation of, of, of everything and it would be worthless. Luckily, I think right now the smart money is on whoever Satoshi Nakamoto is or are, uh, probably lost the key they need to get into their wallet. Um, Honestly, so. they should have sold it in 2018 and just bought that island you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, maybe we should take this question. Sure. Yeah, I had a question about blockchain bridges. I'm, I've been hearing mm-hmm. in the news about all these millions of dollars getting vaporized. Yeah. And, and I just, I don't really, I know that you've got a blockchain here, and I'm guessing you've got a different kind of blockchain. Yep. A bridge is some sort of connector. Who decides? on whether a bridge is is approved for a specific blockchain and what creates those um i guess those vulnerabilities uh, right. of how you know people can tap in and suck all that money out so there are a number of different kinds of bridges um a bridge is, is anything you use to connect applications running on the virtual machine on top of one uh, ledger to applications running the virtual machine running on top of another ledger uh, so there's a so-called trusted bridge um, which is a, a, a trusted bridge is usually some kind of a client who you are trusting to have control of stuff. This is often made of one or more computers that, that have some kind of a vote. So what you do for a trusted bridge, if you want to give them control of two applications, one on each blockchain, is you hand over whatever controls you have of those applications, whatever private keys you have to the, the trusted bridge, and then you trust them to make whatever changes on both chains you're gonna make. So if you're running a marketplace on a trusted bridge and say Coinbase does this, uh, you give them your money and then Coinbase promises to do some stuff with your money, in this case buy and sell tokens for other tokens or tokens for dollars or euros or whatever, and then uh, move that that money uh, out so it could give give control of, of pieces of money back to some of the users when they ask for it. And so far, the Coinbase marketplace has been pretty honest about this, but not everyone is. Yeah, I mean, and there's a decentralized perspective to that too, right? Like, so you have centralized cryptocurrency companies like Coinbase, Gemini, the, the larger exchanges, but then you guys have heard of DeFi, decentralized finance, DEXs, a decentralized exchange, where those are, and you guys could probably talk about this better from a technical perspective, but they're essentially smart contracts right that allow the manipulation of different blockchains so this is what a a decentralized bridge is so essentially it's ideally automated right and i think this goes to your question about these large hacks that are happening Mm -hmm. because you have these smart contracts that say hey um it's all automated there's no centralized control so like we were saying earlier you give this they give that so what they'll do is they'll have pools of cryptocurrency Right, so you'll say, all right, I want to change my Bitcoin to Ethereum. So I send them Bitcoin, and for a fee, they'll intake the Bitcoin, send that Bitcoin to one of their controlled addresses, and then they will output Ethereum to an address of my choosing. Now, what happens is, and again, you guys can talk better from a technical perspective, is that there are issues with the smart contracts. All right, the actual technical code of these bridges that either are manipulated zero days or something that allow a bad actor to go in and say, hey, I can get access to these wallets. And then they transfer the money out. So the the tricky bit with that from a technical perspective, which I mean, what you're talking about uh, requires what they call a trustless bridge. Again, kind of a misnomer, but it means that you're trusting the chains themselves to be honest and basically nobody else, at least for safety. means that the contract on Ethereum, so the program running in the Ethereum virtual machine, needs to be able to know that the contract on Bitcoin got those Bitcoins. It has to be able to read the Bitcoin blockchain. So to do that, it can run a Bitcoin client inside of the Ethereum blockchain, uh, which is crazy expensive. But in principle, you could do it, where inside the, the, the Ethereum virtual machine, you read the latest Ethereum commits and the proof that Ethereum, or latest Bitcoin commits and the proof that the thing that you said happened on Bitcoin actually happened on Bitcoin. Making that check cheap is currently 
And it's not just between Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's been a bunch of different pairs. But making that check cheap is currently where some of the most interesting bugs are and where some of the money has evaporated. So I just want to maybe uh, uh, take a step back in case anybody is maybe having difficulty following some of the more technical discussion. The way I would think about these exchanges, these bridges, is a lot like the money exchangers that you see in the airport. Right. At some point, they have a bank account in the U.S. and a bank account in Europe. And when you go exchange your dollars for euro, all you're doing is you're putting your dollars in their dollar bank account and hoping that they're going to take some euros out of their euro bank account and give them to you. And if they're honest, they will. And if they're not honest, they'll run away. Um, for the decentralized exchanges, it's more like um, Uber or Lyft, where instead of you giving your dollars to, to, to Uber... You are giving your, uh, you are saying, hey Uber, find somebody who wants to sell some euros because I want to sell some dollars. And to be clear, it's a decentralized matchmaker, but yes, those are right. absolutely a thing. Right. Um, and you know, you find somebody who's looking to sell some euros, and you sell them your your dollars for their uh, their euros, um, and you hope that that works out, and you hope that somehow the the Uber contract that you both signed, or the the exchange contract you both signed, actually binds them to give you your euros when you send them your dollars. That's kind of the idea here. Um, and yeah, if they make a mistake in their uh, smart contract, in their code, that lets them take your dollars and then run away without giving you your euros, you're out your dollars. Right. All right. I think I was hoping we could take uh, any audience questions yeah, for just most of this time. So I figure... Line up at the microphone. All right. Um, I've always heard that um, cryptocurrency is supposed to somehow free you from the centrally managed government um, money controls. And in all this time, people always end up referring to Bitcoin in terms of dollars or euros or something. It's, I've never seen, in theory, some kind of exchange system would evolve where they're just talking about you know buying your euro buying your uber or other thing and just going through that exchange it's never become independent has it failed well i guess it depends on you know obviously there's a very large population of cryptocurrency advocates that are i don't know anarchists um amongst other things and there's nothing wrong with that like honestly like i've met some very nice anarchists yeah. who are cryptocurrency advocates. yeah absolutely um and and you know i i think that the initial goal ultimately was to separate from the fiat banking system now the problem is bitcoin's not very good as a privacy blockchain everything's publicly available everything's you know you can trace and there is um very um, large companies that make a lot of money tracing Bitcoin transactions or other cryptocurrency transactions and they can actually associate wallet addresses with social media accounts which your actual name okay if you've ever, ever interacted with Coinbase Gemini any centralized exchange they will know everything associated with any of the the blockchain addresses that you deal with okay now the thing is, there's also some blockchains or cryptocurrencies that are more privacy focused. Monero, Monero comes to mind, um, and we're seeing now if, for Zcash, right? Um, if we're seeing now too, with secondarily to kind of the ransomware epidemic, that we're seeing a lot more of uh, federal government or state government involvement in cryptocurrency regulation. Right? For the longest time, it was really just the New York Department of Financial Services that hated cryptocurrency. Now, other states in the federal government are kind of getting involved and wanting to regulate it. But I think generally, um, yes, to your question, I think that we've not gotten to this point where we've been able to separate things. You have to really, really try to make sure that your cryptocurrency transactions are truly decentralized. Um, and I think as cryptocurrency becomes more mainstream, we're going to go further. And this is my personal opinion. We're going to go farther away from this decentralized goal because um, your everyday person isn't going to say, all right, I'm going to load up uh, Tor on my computer behind a VPN. I'm going to sanitize all my Bitcoin addresses, not send to any centralized you know, repository or exchange and things like that. It's really, really, really hard to do that versus popping up the Coinbase app, popping up Cash App, and say, hey, I want to send some Bitcoin to my friend. So 
So I think I would I would point out that there have been at least some quote unquote successes in um, freeing people's money from uh, government fiat control, and the biggest one is Chinese capital controls. Uh, if you are rich and in China and you have a lot of money and you want to buy something expensive not in China, um, the Chinese government will make it very hard to do that. Uh, so what you do is you buy something in China that's very expensive and you transport it over the border and then you sell it somewhere else. And if you're smuggling diamonds over the border, they will try and catch you. But if you're smuggling bitcoins over the border, that's much harder. To, or well, okay, if you're smuggling Zcash over the border, that's much harder to catch. <laughs> if you're smuggling bitcoins over the border at this point, they'll probably catch you. It's um. a great question, though. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, so given like the decentralized nature of blockchains, right? Um, it kind of seems that one slight mistake and you kind of you could lose everything, right? Like you don't really have much recourse. Um, yeah, that's that code is law thing you were talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly right. So like from a technical standpoint and from a legal standpoint, too, um, do you like and also, I guess, without giving up that decentralization, do you ever see like foresee in the next five to 10 years? Like, is this a problem that we could kind of solve or mitigate? Or do you think that's just something that we're just going to have to contend with? Mitigate. For sure. I mean, I think I think this is something a lot of people are thinking about. Like, um, how do you do this without giving up decentralization? I, I don't think we'll ever fully solve it. Um, I don't know that I have a theorem to that effect, but I... I we will never solve bugs. Y well, that I have a theorem to, right. to, to that effect. Uh, that, that, I have that proof. Um, but um, in terms of, of not having any recourse, I, I could imagine having some thing... Uh, uh, some, ways of saying, hey, there's some recovery in a decentralized way using some clever crypto that I don't know about, um, but uh, probably because it hasn't been invented yet. But um, I, I don't know that we'll ever fully solve that. And if we want to stay decentralized, I think that is going to be part of it. To some extent, if you want to run things on a virtual machine that, that runs kind of like a computer, but on top of a ledger, then the state of the virtual machine is determined by the rules of that machine. And if your code does the thing it says, um, you can go sort of around the whole process. You can you can pull a, an Ethereum, Ethereum cash um, split and get the people who maintain the chain to basically vote, yeah, screw this, we're going back to an earlier state and moving on with our lives. Um, but I think a lot of people feel like that kind of defeats part of the point. Yeah, and I mean, to the question about, you know, making a mistake, like I... Um, you know, have messed around on the Binance Smart Chain a little bit. Um, now, if you guys aren't familiar with that, Binance is a very large exchange. They kind of used an Ethereum clone to create a smart contracting um, blockchain and um, was trying to purchase something. And I actually sent a bunch of, um, what, what token do they use? For, for, is it BNB? I have no idea. Yeah, BNB. Um, instead of sending it to the recipient address, I sent it to the contract address of the smart contract, um, which means it's gone forever unless the owner of the smart contract address wants to give me my BNB back, which they did not. Um, so to your question, um, I don't know if there's a way on mistake transactions that are sent, right? Because that is a big bar for a lot of people. And it's very scary, especially when you're setting large funds, which is why they say, you know, double check, you know, copy and paste when you can do test transactions, things like that. But you, to, to, you know, if you, you would need a mechanism typically on like Ethereum or other mainstream blockchains where you need 51% of the network to create consensus to reverse the transaction, right? Which if you do that, okay, who's validating that, right? Who's saying, hey, this is a worthwhile thing to do. Right. Because I know that there was a couple hacks on a different couple blockchains that were maybe a little bit more centralized where the validator said, hey, we're going to reverse this. I mean, Ethereum. Right. Yeah, yeah, it was famous. Ethereum, Ethereum did it did once, that. but some of the smaller ones have done it like straight up maliciously. Right. Exactly. And that's and that's the point. Right. So can you have a, a, a blockchain technology that you trust where there is a way to reverse transactions easily? And I, w I would say no. So uh, unfortunately, this also goes back a little bit to, to your question, um, which is there there is a group of people who control any given blockchain. It's whoever the voters are and that currency. And there's also a group of people who control uh, the U.S. dollar to some extent, right? The, the Fed and some combination of them and the U.S. government control the U.S. dollar. Um, 
if you are worried about one or the other of those groups screwing you over, especially if you're very rich and large enough for them to pay attention to, uh, you have to pick which one you like more. Uh, so, um, I'm not even sure how to ask my question, but um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, when, when I think about um, uh, Bitcoin, I think about the the story of the guy who had Bitcoin, early adopter. And you kind of alluded to that. Bought a pizza for two Bitcoin. Now that's like a twenty five thousand. There's ten thousand Bitcoins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, but what, what I'm getting at is, is you know, if is this a replacement currency or an alternate currency? A currency is something I can give you money for, you give me something for, and a year later, it's rough, roughly still an even exchange, not, now, you've got my one Bitcoin. Hey, Rich, is it a currency million. at all? Yeah, well, that's that's my question. Is it some sort of investment where I'm hoping to rich? Well, it, yeah, to use? yeah, totally. And, and so I, I definitely get that. But to answer your point, um, what, what am I going to say? It depends, right? <laughs> um, so the United States government, the IRS, have decided that Bitcoin and, and similar cryptocurrency is property. It is not currency because there's different tax issues that arise from that, right? So one of the benefits to that is that you can get, you know, um, like uh, tax loss harvesting. I don't know if we have any day traders in here, right? So there are some benefits to it. There are some non-benefits to it. But like, for instance, if you're trading stocks, and you you are at a loss for a position you can sell that incur a loss and then you can buy something in the same kind of industry and then when the industry kind of goes up you still have that loss to offset any gains well as cryptocurrency is considered property what i can do is i can like say bitcoin crashes like 60 percent i can like sell my bitcoin get that 60 percent loss and then i can buy back bitcoin right afterwards with no tax issues. Whereas with stock, you need to wait 30 days. You can't do that with currency, right? There's different, like you, you do, you don't, you would not be able to like essentially tax subsidize a loss on, on, on a currency, right? Like, you know, in part because currency doesn't really lose its value, right? And that's one of the big, you know, cause the dollar might lose its value in, you know, in, in, you know, comparison to like the British pound or, you know, the Chinese yuan or something like that. But like, it doesn't like $1 is $1, right? Now, one of the biggest problems with Bitcoin specifically and cryptocurrency generally is you have these maximalists that are, you know, completely want to replace fiat, but it's, it's, there's just too much up and down in the cost, right? And that's why I say, you know, for the long, for several years, like everyone's really proud about like, being able to purchase and, and sell things in Bitcoin. And even though I consider myself a Bitcoin fan maximalist, I want it to go everywhere and be super big. I don't think Bitcoin should be used to buy things um, because, you know, you, you know, for instance, the pizzas, right? Like 10,000 Bitcoin for it was the first commercial transaction re regarding Bitcoin ever. And that's great. But, you know, that's how much money is that worth now? Or like something where like, okay, I'm going to go buy an umbrella with Bitcoin. And then two weeks later, I, I have a $2,000 umbrella, you know? And so that is a hurdle that we're going to have to face with the cryptocurrency industry generally, because a lot of people look at cryptocurrency as a joke, right? As the, the tulip issue, right? Like just, it's just, it's just not a good thing to do because of the ups and downs and, and how you could buy one Bitcoin for $500 one day, it could be worth $10,000 the next day. And the day after that, it could be worth a dollar. Numbers made up, obviously. So the, the kind of the premise of this was Let's talk about blockchain. So this technology is interesting. So what do you see? Is the do you see any changes in the cryptocurrency from the bit, the bit, the excuse me the blockchain standpoint? NFTs. Is there any other technology we can expect to see from the blockchain technology technology coming up? I mean, I think there's a lot of innovation going on in this space. So it's kind of hard to predict what will come out tomorrow. Uh, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about it. I think. Um, uh, that just happens when you get a whole lot of smart people and you tell them, hey, invent on this platform, <laughs> which is kind of cool. But um, I think, look, at the end of the day, they're, they're really about solving a particular issue, which is how do you have a decentralized ledger? We, we've talked about what that means. When you don't want to have a cabal of people that everybody has to trust. Um, instead, you have this, this 
much weaker trust assumption. Importantly, you don't completely get rid of it, but you get a much weaker one. And I think we are still trying to figure out exactly what that is useful for and what it's not, and we are making some mistakes along the way. But I think we have some some interesting, a lot of people working on finding good solution, good uses of that. I think I'm looking forward to, to three things uh, in blockchain land. One is better privacy. Um, we actually able to do some surprising things with some pretty clever cryptography in terms of maintaining a ledger of just like money transfers where who has how much money and, and who's doing a transfer at any given time is private. So uh, Zcash does this with um, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, it's a whole thing. Um, but running a general purpose machine, like a, uh, an Ethereum virtual machine where you can write arbitrary programs that, that run up there and you sort of pay for the runtime, um, is not yet widely available, at least in, in, a, in a private way where no one really sees what exactly is going on in your program. Um, a second is increased performance. So <clears throat> right now, on a lot of these blockchains, everybody has to fight for a fairly limited number of transactions that can actually execute per second. This is another barrier to widespread adoption if you want to use it as a day-to-day -day currency. Um, Bitcoin takes an hour and you have to fight everyone else on Earth to pay for your coffee, um, which is not great. Uh, and a third thing is interchain compatibility. So this goes back to the bridge stuff we were talking about earlier, but if my application can run on its ledger run by its voters who represent what my application trusts and your application can run on its uh, ledger run by its voters running represent who your application trusts then I mean on a good day they can run in parallel so not fighting with each other and um, they should be able to we should be able to find ways for them to cooperate without them having to agree on who the trustworthy parties are everybody like one of the things that makes ethereum so expensive is finding a set of voters who are so trustworthy that all the applications on Ethereum can run it. And even then, obviously not everybody trusts it, right? JP Morgan does not keep their bank account system on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, they run their own, it's called Quorum. Um, so I'm looking forward to those. I'm hoping that that takes us away from some of this centralized trust model and some of this these performance problems, some of these privacy problems. Uh, I don't know what that'll do outside of finance. I don't think we will ever want to run our video games on replicated state machines because I mostly care about performance for those and they can run on my own phone. I'm the only person I can cheat is me. Um, so I, I actually think something that's going to have to happen is that, and, and you might not have heard about it, but it's, it's coming up, is the quantum computing problem. Right, right now, different blockchains are secured via different algorithms, right? Like Bitcoin is H SHA-256. Yeah, I mean, even just um, those signatures we talked about right at the beginning, right. some of those won't hold up. Like you'll be able to fake signatures with a good enough quantity. Yeah, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to break the encryption on most, you know, cryptocurrency blockchains in the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, hopefully longer than that, but maybe even shorter given our advances in quantum computing. So having a quantum resistant crypto cryptography uh, method, right? And then, you know, to innovation and blockchain, one of the big hurdles is all the massive amounts of vaporware out there, right? Like, there's a lot of good things, a lot of good, like, there's some blockchains that are uh, basically doing, like, decentralized storage, right? Like, oh, hey, I'm going to pay you tokens for offering up terabytes of storage, and then you can have a platform by which say, hey, I want to decentralize my storage. You'll be in multiple pieces in multiple locations. You can think of the security benefits for that, right? Um, you have other ones where people are uh, exploring with gaming on the blockchain, which, you know, it's more like MUD versus MMORPG, okay? But they're doing it, right? And it's a very nascent technology. And like, I'm part of one, um, and if you guys want to know about it, I'll tell you about it later, but where your NFT, like you got airdrop equipment or you could purchase equipment, go for it. And then you can actually battle other NFTs using your avatar for the NFT, right? And so there is innovation in the space. Um, there are, I mean, frankly, it's, it's limitless, um, but you know, there are con constraints, right? Because it's not, you know, the, the, you know, I think you, you hit it on the head, Isaac, with, you know, transactions per second, where you know if you're trying to do something more complicated than a public di publicly distributed ledger transactions per second matters um, but really you can do whatever you want the innovation is out there the problem is 
there's so many places out there where you read the white paper and you're like, this looks like it was created by some crappy AI. Um, we don't understand what this is. And yet they're like, oh yeah, we raised $500 million in two days. We're going to do great. You know what I mean? And it's like, how do you pick something that is innovative and, and, and trust it, even though it's a decentralized technology that you're like, oh, I don't want to have to trust someone, but you're actually trusting the developers to do what they want to do. And with the, the file storage one in particular, Filecoin was the big one there. Yeah, uh, we have friends it, who worked on that. Yeah, I, we, we have a, a good friend who worked on looking at their mechanism and ended up proving that it, it fundamentally won't work. Right. You can always cheat uh, Filecoin. Yeah, it's, right. it's the proof of replication. It's, um, it's proving that I am not one person pretending to store the file twice when I only actually stored it once. Right. right. And, and, and look, I mean, this is just proof that, like, what Rich was saying is even harder because it's not just the ones that look like they were written by AIs. These were written by some very smart people right. who thought they had something very right and then, you know, uh, couldn't prove it, gave it to somebody who uh, is even more expert and then they tried to prove it, thought it would work, and then found a flaw. Right. So I will say, I think there are a lot of applications that do not need a blockchain and some of them are reaching for one because it seems like a cool idea or because it's, you know, AI. Trendy. Uh, machine learning. Yeah, I'm not not sure that those we already had that algorithm. Useful, um, <laughs> but uh, but even like if I'm going to run a multi-user dungeon like you described, and my my GM who's actually managing the dungeon has ultimate power, um, I can just let them run it on their computer. They don't, we don't have to go through a, a blockchain to do that anyway. Right. Uh, so I guess sort of following up on that, um, you were mentioning distributed systems. Mm -hmm. um, so I work for a company that does uh, um, basically event event or service bus based uh, event command uh, mes messaging system, and so the, our, our architecture is fully message based. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never really explored applications of blockchain in that. You know, I mean, all of our security model is token based. Um, are there sort of opportunities? That, it's not a huge company. It's mostly kind of a self contained. Um, system, but are there kind of opportunities in just sort of a every man type world for blockchain from technology? What you're describing, I would suspect that you have a much simpler trust model yeah. than what requires blockchain. Okay. So I think what you'd be doing is slowing down your company's computing yeah. for not much advantage. Yeah, that, okay, that sounds like a great way to spend to to hire a whole bunch of voters to vote on stuff that you didn't need them to vote on. Okay. okay. <laughs> Yeah, but, Sadly, that's but will it increase their budget, though, if they say <laughs> that they're going to install a blockchain? I talked to the Swiss Post about that at one point. Well, not, okay, some dude from the Swiss Post about that at one point. <laughs> and uh, they were terrible plans. Yeah, no, it's just so earlier when I was doing my quotations, it's so funny because I read a lot of white papers and other things, and, and you see these kind of PR publications where it's like, you know, you, you literally have a bingo card of all these different things and you're like, all right, you did not tell me what you actually do, <laughs> you know. Um, I was wondering, I keep hearing on the news about how much energy Bitcoins Ooh. are using and, yeah. and it just, it, it sounds almost exponential. When is Bitcoin going to crash because they don't have enough energy left? As long as Bitcoins are it, worth anything. <laughs> Well, they, they are. It is exponential, um, literally. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Bitcoin works on a, a technology called proof of work, which is essentially you have to, in order to limit the amount of Bitcoin that get mined, Rich talked about this earlier, that there's a, a limit to how much Bitcoin can get mined. The way they do that is by saying you have to prove that you've spent enough CPU cycles on this. And you do that through some, some cryptographic techniques uh, called hashing. Um, well, CPU cycles are energy. So they are going to use more and more energy. Uh, there's a lot of work right now on other ways of doing this, this limiting um, so that you don't have to use as much lim uh, energy. Uh, this is why people talk about things like proof of stake uh, or proof of file they're trying to do, but I don't know that they figured it out. File do that at least. Yeah. Um, Chia does proof of storage. We'll see if that's less wasteful in the end. Uh, Ethereum, I think, just move to proof of stake no they there so to. the merge is planned for two weeks september right. 13th i am I'm a, I'm a big ethereum person which is weird because I've, I've been in cryptocurrency so long i remember when they had their ico and i was like this is stupid <laughs> there's a i was stupid okay because then i'm like oh well i'll just spend 25 dollars a week buying ethereum 
was like a dollar thirty five at that point. I was really mad. I missed out on the ICO, right? Of course, I didn't keep on my Ethereum either. So, you guys are welcome. There's a an old joke uh, among academic computer scientists. Somebody came up with a, a joke uh, paper and video about dollar coin, the only coin with proof of dollar, where you had to write the hash of the previous block on a dollar and burn it yeah, in front of the camera in order to... <laughs> every element of the ledger is a video of a dollar burning. Um, I mean, it's, it's a way of making voting expensive. So is proof of work, so is proof of stake. You know, like talking yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, when they came up with blockchain technology, it was really... Uh, hypothetical right and i don't i mean i think that there was hopes that it was going to reach the place it has now um i'm not sure they thought that an entire chinese industry would be created around mining software or a6 computer software right um you know where you know and if you guys go into and this isn't so much blockchains but like bitcoin mining like hardware is such a scam because what will happen is is these these companies that actually create the miners the asics so back in the day you used to be able to do it with like a cpu right the, to solve this proof of work algorithm um and then then you needed to use a graphics card and then because what happens what is at every block that's solved the more computing power there is on the blockchain the more difficult the question gets I mean, in short we up the price of voting to keep too many people from doing it right and so what happened is you then entered into this like this this hot war of computing power and um these these mining companies what they'll do is they'll like and it's also been great for reducing the size of of cpu chips but they'll create this, you know, a smaller chip with more processing power. And what they'll do is they'll make hundreds, if not thousands of machines. They'll mine on those machines for X amount of time. And then they'll sell those machines to retail users or other mining companies um, while they're building the other ones. And so you've created this kind of this weird, incestuous, um, like hardware sale like cycle um, that has done nothing but massively increase the power requirement to solve a block on the on the Bitcoin blockchain, as well as the power required to do so. One last question. Cool. So one of the original use cases for uh, mostly for Bitcoin when they used to talk all the good stuff, but crypto in general is international remittances. And for those of us who have family in CIS countries that aren't named Russia or Ukraine, um, that became a complete shit show about six months ago when SWIFT first cut off Russia and then all those other CIS countries which were still basing their banking systems off of the Russian state bank suddenly couldn't use any of the standard remittance services anywhere. So we all jumped up and said, oh hey, this is what crypto is great for. Except for the fact that all of the ones that are not named Kazakhstan have banned all cryptocurrency at their federal level. So the only way you can do it is by you send crypto to some guy that might be in a shopping mall somewhere who's going to meet your recipient and show phones to each other. And maybe just maybe it might work. But reality question is, how is adoption going to continue to exist at all when major level state actors just say no? Yeah, I mean, from a legal, yeah, I mean, and and I think everybody knows the answer, right? Like, you got to raise that anarchist flag up and just, you know, it's like when, when but the answer know. was it depends, right? Well, yeah, that's. Are, are, are you are you out here stumping for the pirate party yes. now? Yes. Well, that's exactly what I was just going to say, right? Like when all the whenever you know when that one uh, streaming service took all that stuff off of their streaming service the other week, and it's like, all right, raising the black flag. You know what I mean? It, 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 but at the end of the day, you have to decide. I think Isaac said, like, who do you trust more, right? And who's going to make? I mean, at the end of the day, we're all humans. We have needs, requirements, wants, safety issues, things like that, right? And is a federal government really going to go after a person for sending five hundred dollars in bitcoin to a relative somewhere i i would hope not i mean outside of maybe china and russia um but you know you have to do a cost benefit analysis because we're going to see more regulatory frameworks put in place for cryptocurrency right now i'm actually surprised we haven't had more stringent requirements put in place in the us yet um i know there's a couple bills that are out there that are seeking to regulate it it seems that the current administration is like 
51% okay with cryptocurrency. We're not quite sure yet. Um, but I mean, to answer your question from a legal perspective, like, yeah, you can get into a lot of trouble. Now, again, if you're sending, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a immutable transaction, right? You can't change it. Now, the question is, would you get in trouble? Would someone located in a more friendly jurisdiction get in trouble? No. Right. But, you know, are you putting, you know, the recipient in some type of danger? Maybe. So at the end of the day for remittances, what you need is someone near you who will take the money you've got and someone near the recipient who will give them the money they want. And those two people have to agree to, to do this together, to take your money and give the recipient money. And cryptocurrency can help with that if the two people we're talking about are people who can send cryptocurrency between each other and, and care to and the police can't stop them uh, or don't stop them. Right. Um, but they, they don't necessarily have to be. I mean, in principle, banks could be better at remittances. You could have a, a bank branch in one country and a bank branch in another country. Um, the reasons they don't are complicated and have to do with regulation and probably greed. Um, but I think I think a lot of these uh, pie in the sky ideas of oh well, this technological so solution will just solve this this human problem of international remittances or or whatever similar level of problem sometimes comes from not recognizing the uh i mean sometimes it's a human problem yeah the the right. nature of the problem at some point um if you know uh just to, to name a country i have no idea what the the laws there are but if tajikistan decides i you know i really don't want to allow remittances into my country for some reason it's kind of hard to do anything about that right. by just inventing a new technology um All right. Um, well, I think that is all the time we have. Uh, reminder to rate this panel if uh, at least you thought it was good. If you didn't like it or if you were totally bored, just forget about rating the panel. Don't <laughs> bother with that. And uh, we continue to accept donations for Open Hand Atlanta. There's a bucket up here. It's just behind the sign. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, everyone.